virgin of virgins were committed, I pray and beseech thee that through thine intercession, I may be spotless in mind, pure in heart, chaste in mind and body, to serve Jesus and Mary all the days of my life. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the St. Joseph Dialogos. We are live with Timothy Flanders and special guest, very special guest, Dr. Lawrence Feingold. Dr. Feingold, welcome. Thank you for having Doctor, me. Doctor, yeah, of course. It's 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 our pleasure for sure. Dr. Feingold um, is professor of theology and philosophy at Kenrick Glennon Seminary here in beautiful St. Louis. Uh, he teaches on the Eucharist and sacraments and fundamental theology, all of which you've written books about, if I'm not mistaken. And we have it on good authority that he has written the definitive text on the nature and grace debate. That's that itself might be debated, that, but we'll see. It's not true. Okay. It can't be. Well, we'll, we'll take it up with the source and we'll get his refutation of your uh, denial. <laughs> this, this, this is, this, it, for people that don't know, that's that's one of those bitter debates of the 20th mm. century, I think, uh, theologically. So high praise. Well, and and uh, I can tell you where that source came from later, if you ask me. <laughs> later on. Yeah, later on. Privately, of course. Anyhow, uh, tonight's episode is going to be about limited inerrancy. If you don't know what that is, no problem. We'll do the best we can to explain it. For those of you who are aware, this has been raging for the last 60 or so years. In fact, prior to that, if we count uh, the end of the 19th century, uh, Dei Verbum 11, Vatican Council 2, Leo the 13th, all these topics will come up and more as we begin. So uh, here we are. Um, Dr. Feingold, do you want to offer any introductory remarks before we dive into the topic? Anything you'd like to promote before we, uh, before we get started? Um, well, I'm going to be drawing on my, my book on this topic. So I have um, a book, um, Faith Comes from What is Heard, um, An Introduction of Fundamental Theology, published by Emmaus Academic. And this is a textbook of fundamental theology from the seminarians at Kenrick Seminary. And I do have a chapter on um, inerrancy of scripture. So I'm going to be making use of that during the course of this conversation, I think. I can say it's well worth uh, the money order from Emmaus Academic directly. And it, honestly, it was something that we used in uh, graduate school as well. Dr. Mike Cirilla taught my fundamental theology course, and that was the book that we, we drew from most. So uh, it, again, worth it. Support Dr. Feingold, support the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology. All right. Uh, I, I, should, I should step out of the way. I should let Tim take over as interlocutor. And away we go. So, oh, okay. Mr. Flanders, what do you have to say about limited oh, inerrancy? Well, um, well, what I'd like to introduce this this conversation, Dr. Vinecold, about mm -hmm. is is I'd like to get your take first on some fundamental principles of analysis when we look at Vatican II as a whole. Okay. And this is coming from a distinction that I read in Dietrich von Hildebrand's book, Charitable Anathema, in which he's dealing with the Vatican II controversy and and progressives after the council and um they are claiming that oh such and such pushed this at the council such and such pushed this at the council therefore we can ergo the council is uh, you know a movement of progressivism and whatnot <clears throat> but the distinction i what i mean to say is that the distinction is between the historical meaning or significance of a council and the theological meaning of a council and what I mean by that is the theological meaning is understood by scholars and theologians and people who are knowledgeable. They've read all this in Latin. They've reviewed the relatio. They've reviewed the tradition. They've reviewed everything and they can understand and interpret. This is what Lumen Gentium makes mention of in the appendix when it says that all of the, the theological note of the council is known to all because we all know the theological rules of understanding this council, right? So that's a the, the theological meaning is known to theologians and people who are working. Right. Um, exactly. However, on the other hand, there is a historical significance. And this very much has to do with the laity in, in a large part, because the laity are in their parish and they're just experiencing a historical event for what it is. Um, and but I, I think that the historic there can be a, a, a disconnect. And I think there is such a disconnect with in regards to Vatican II. But in fairness, I think that can be said of many councils in the, in the history of the church. So it's, it's not like it's a 
a terrible, you know, once in a huge thing. But um, it seems so. Let me give an example uh, outside of our topic. An example is the phrase "religious freedom." The phrase "religious freedom" has a historical meaning that's tied to American manifest destiny ideology and all that sort of thing. That has a particular political historical meaning. The phrase "religious freedom," right? To, so common layperson has an understanding of that, whereas the theological doctrine of religious freedom contained in Divina Salus Humanae is an entirely different thing. And so to start talking about religious freedom, uh, it can cause an issue because of, there's an already a historical. Now, Divina Humanae has a clause that says, it basically says none of the things that we said before are are revoked at all. So it 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 takes that away. So there's no even though the, the, there's difficulties. But let me first ask you, before we get into day verbum 11 and the whole issue of limited inerrancy, what do you think about this distinction between a theological significance and the meaning and the historical significance in terms of our analysis of the event of Vatican II? What do you think about that? Yeah, no, that makes sense. So I'm, I'm a theologian, and so I'm going to try and give you the theological meaning, right? And I think that... Um, um, a th- that's that's much more circumscribed. In other words, there are rules for attaining the theological meaning of council documents, and that is fundamentally to read it in continuity with um, the tradition, with scripture, and above all, the more recent magisterium and magisterium that's come after it interpreting it. Right. So I'm going to try and give that input. Now, yes, obviously, all the um, all the deeds of the church. And therefore, um, ecumenical councils, um, people uh, encyclicals take place in history and get interpreted and implemented in history. And one of the um, difficulties always is to get um, to get um, let's say things like ecumenical councils in their documents to get them implemented in the true sense, in the theological sense, and not in some distorted. Um, sense, or another possibility is simply not be implemented. And that's always a problem in the history of the church, is that sometimes there are great documents with great guidelines that don't actually reach the faithful sitting in the pew and form their lives and form their uh, Christian imagination. Yeah, right? absolutely. I yeah, think that's that a sense. problem with the Second Vatican Council, is many of its great legacies haven't been fully implemented, haven't been heard, and therefore haven't been put into real life by the people in the pew. And then things right. that the council doesn't say are promoted as if they are the council and they do form real life, often tragically. So could you say then, um, maybe by way of analogy, that the councils are prone to be misimplemented? Sure, just as scripture like we- is, right? In other words, sure. the word of God is of divine authority, but it needs to be rightly understood. And something analogous goes for all uh, magisterial documents. Right? They, um, they're not the same as scripture. They're not inspired in the same way, but they have an assistance of the Holy Spirit. But we have to um, rightly understand what the Spirit wants to say or guides the church in saying. And it's easy to misinterpret it, just as it's easy to misinterpret scripture. Yes, I, I you think. Say that, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I, I was just going to ask Dr. Feingold. Would you say that Dei Verbum Eleven, in particular, is an instance of uh, misimplementation, or could we ascribe to it some sort of ambiguity? Um. A superficial reading, I think, um, might encounter ambiguity, but not one following the, I think, the the proper rules of interpretation. So I don't think, I think it's, I personally think it's a magnificent text, but just like everything else, has to be read carefully. And that's what I think we want to do here. Why don't we, why don't we, can you, Dr. Feingold, can you give us a, a little bit of a background to the the question of the inerrancy of Holy yeah. Scripture, um, which is visited by Trent and Vatican I, but really becomes acute with the modernist crisis with Lamentaboli, etc., and then is sort of revisited with Dave Arab 11. Can you give us a little bit of a, 
uh, a background as to what is the doctrine of the church regarding biblical inerrancy. Yeah, great. It's a consequence of inspiration. So, so we should start with biblical inspiration. Um, because the um, scripture, the Bible, is the word of God and has God as its author, right? as um, Council of Trent, Vatican I, and Vatican II all teach, therefore it has properties um, that are unique to it. And, um, and a key property um, that comes to it because it's the word of God is truth. And so perhaps it's better to use the positive. Dave Verb, I think, wisely um, speaks positively of the truth of scripture rather than negatively of inerrancy. But they come down to the same thing, right? What's true is not false, right? But truth, putting it positively, that gives it a richness. In other words, scripture is true in a richness. Um, in other words, with a multiplicity of true senses, not just one. And... Um, yeah, so it's a property of um, inspiration, um, and it's a um, something that the fathers of the church took for granted. And before that, Jesus, I think, simply presupposes when he says Scripture can't be broken. Right? Then he just puts down Scripture. Some it is written as the ultimate word, and the um, the early church received that from Jesus, and the fathers have this conviction. And we, this comes out in um, St. Augustine and St. Jerome. They um, both agree that the word of God is true, although their works may contain error, right? That no saint has this prerogative. All right. um, it was pretty much taken as um, a settled truth um, throughout the time of you know, Christological controversy, Trinitarian controversy, and the, um, all the way up through the Reformation. None of the reformers directly challenged um, either the inspiration or the inerrancy of scripture, but it becomes a problem in the 18th century, really, with the um, uh, with the Enlightenment and with um, a naturalist view of scripture and revelation. In other words, a lack of faith in divine, a supernatural revelation, and then just simply taking it as a human word. And, and so it first comes out in liberal Protestantism in the 19th century within the church. In the Enlightenment, it had been more or less anti-Catholic, in other words, anti-Christian, polemics, but it enters into the church, um, broadly speaking, in with liberal Protestantism in the 19th century, um, and that begins to have influence towards the end of the 19th century, and it really comes out with the modernist crisis at the beginning of the century. And so this is when the church has to take a stand on this, and so we first find a magisterial teaching with Leo XIII in his great biblical encyclical, Providentissimus Deus, and he just simply lays out the doctrine of um, biblical inerrancy in in that great encyclical. Um, so, what what level of magisterium should we ascribe to Providentissimus Deus? Yeah, is so he is he defining? No. Is he just teaching? I don't. He's, I don't mean to say just yeah. teaching, but okay. is right. it a dogmatic so, definition? No, it's certainly not a dogmatic definition. But he's putting something down. He thinks as constant teaching of antiquity. So let me um, let me take a step back. Um, church magisterial documents, we can um, give them, a um, they require one of three different grades of assent. Right? So a dogmatic definition would require the assent of faith. That would be the highest. I firmly believe what is um, taught here because it's contained in divine revelation. The second grade is when the church teaches something definitively, even though it's not directly revealed by God, um, but it's intimately connected with divine revelation. And then the third level, which is by far the more common, is what we call ordinary magisterium of the church, um, which isn't um, infallible, it's not definitive, but um, requires of Catholics to religiously adhere to it, that is to um, assent to it, even knowing that it could perhaps be modified. Leo the Thirteenth is speaking in that way, but it seems reasonable to think that he's speaking about um, something held by the ordinary universal magisterium of the church. And let me just read this real quick. This this is from Providentibus Deus twenty one. He says that those who maintain that an error is possible in any genuine passage of sacred writings either pervert the Catholic notion of inspiration or make God the author of such an error. And then he goes on, as Dr. Feingold just said, 
so emphatically where all the fathers and doctors agreed that divine writings has left uh, are free from all error that they labored earnestly with no less skill and reverence to reconcile each passage. So they were reconciling appearances of contradictions. Right. Uh, yeah. So I want to note the, the terms all error, all mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. right. can maintain that a error is possible. So it's pretty absolute in terms of its, but there is a note here that anyone, any genuine passage of scripture, but there is, there is actually a, a note here from St. Augustine where he says, quoting St. Augustine, um, on my yeah, part, text. oh, go ahead, Dr. Fungal. Yeah, so I love this text of St. Augustine. And so what do you do with um, a text of scripture that um, is difficult? Right? And so he lists there three things that he does. Um, if I find anything that seems contrary to truth, I shall not hesitate to conclude either the text is faulty. That means that in the course of copying, right, the manuscript tradition, a certain passage has become um, has lost its original um, wording and sense. All right, so that's possible because we don't have the original text. We have copied manuscripts, copied and copied and copied. And that's a, there's a whole science of that textual criticism. Um, second thing, um, translation, right? The translator hasn't rightly expressed the meaning of the passage. Um, and yes, of course that can happen. And that's why it's helpful to know the original languages. But even there, to look at other exegetes and to see the different ways it's been interpreted. Um, but of course, the third possibility is I don't understand. And so that's the humility of the Catholic exegete is to rather think I don't understand than that the divine author made an error. So and, and I want to emphasize with this initial distinction that I wanted to say is that the 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 an inerrancy of scripture is very much a, a, a lay doctrine in the sense that lay people hear the, hear the scripture read. They've heard, they've seen passion plays for centuries. And, you know, we've always, the lay people have always been reading the scripture, whether it's orally or performed or all sorts of different methods, but that would be all on the assumption that everything that's said in the scripture is true. So yeah. the lay people, we're, we're not, we're not trying to get into all these philosophical distinctions, <laughs> but we're just assuming that everything's being told of us actually happened as right. it says in the scriptures. So right. I think this is a very uh, relevant question for lay people. Um, so my next question, Dr. Feingold, is do, to what degree does the magister sort of definitively close this question prior to Vatican II, starting with Leo XIII? Yeah, well, I think he, he doesn't directly close it definitively, but he implies that this is simply um, what we call the universal ordinary magisterium of the church. And that is when you have the constant teaching, even though it's not solemnly defined, um, that we should hold that as definitive. Right? So that's more or less how he leaves it. And then it comes up shortly thereafter um, by Pope Benedict um, the 15th in, in his um, Spiritus Paracletus. And he likewise defends, oh, one more thing we should say about Providentissimus Deus is he opposes two different kind of errors here. One would be the more radical, simply denying um, any you know, special inspiration and truth of scripture. But um, another thing he's concerned about is um, a position held by good Catholic theologians like John Henry Newman, St. John Henry Newman, um, that um, was seeking to deal with difficulties in scripture by um, holding the idea that um, a particular passage might contain an error um, in what's not being directly, so he makes a, a comparison to um, in what's not the direct point of a passage, something said in passing, um, something that's merely his, historical, um, but not what the sacred author is directly intending to assert, something along those lines. And so, maybe, all right, can I can yeah. I jump in and, and maybe offer an example? Because mm -hmm. I was I was teaching my students this, in, in fact, yesterday. Um, cause we've been covering the enlightenment. We've been covering rationalism and skepticism and what that did to people's faith. And the, the analogy that I used, um, uh, one young man raised his hand and said, well, if there's hyperbole in the Bible, doesn't that mean that we should not trust it until it's proven otherwise? And I said, well, no, it's because hyperbole in the Bible, first of all, isn't as frequent as you might think it is. And secondly, it's because just because something is said hyperbolically, doesn't mean it's not true. Right. For, for instance, I go to the concert. I have a great time. 
I come back the next day. You say, how was it? Oh, man, it was the best time of my life. Everybody was there. Well, that's impossible. Not everybody would fit in a single concert venue. And maybe it really wasn't the best time of my whole life, but I'm using hyperbolic language to express some truth. Is that the sort of thing that you're getting at here? Maybe the, the sacred authors are yeah. using phrases that aren't literally true, but they're not saying the meaning of the literal statement. Is that what you mean? No, or am, not I, exactly. am I misunderstanding? We, that's very important. And we, we need to come back to that because that's something that Pius XII introduces to solve many issues. Um, but what I'm referring to is something that came up prior to that. And it was um, the idea that there might be parts of scripture um, which might not be inerrant. And that's what Leo XIII wants to exclude. It's a property of all of scripture. In other words, okay. I can't solve a problem, let's say about a particular text that may be hyperbole, by saying that part is not inspired or inerrant. So okay, that makes sense. The plenary inerrancy. We'll come back, in other words, yes, it all needs to be rightly interpreted. It's not, it's true, rightly interpreted, not wrongly interpreted. And we'll come back to that. Very well. All right. So Leo XIII, his, his concern there is to say it's true because it has God as its author, and that applies to the whole of it because the whole of it is inspired. So that right there would exclude a limited inerrancy, which would right. limit right. the truth of Scripture and the inspiration of Scripture. So everything in Scripture is true. There's no errors contained in it if it's rightly understood and if it's the true copy and all right. that. And if you if you think there's an error, you just don't understand. You, you, right. but you, you, don't, you cannot assert that there's an error. Right. But again, we're going to have to come back more closely to the question of um, what the sacred author intends to affirm. Okay. That's but really but just to establish sort of a, a jumping off point, this is Leo saying um, with all the necessary qualifications that mm -hmm. as of 1893, no Catholic can hold that scripture contains error. Right. Rightly understood. Oh, okay. With the Rightly, right. Sure. Okay. Very well. All right. Okay. So, so you, then you, fast you were, forward you to mention Benedict the Fifteenth okay. is where you so were at. He, <laughs> he enters into this with an, an encyclical on the anniversary of um, Saint Jerome. So it's an encyclical on Saint Jerome, and Saint Jerome was a great defender of um, biblical, um, the truth of Scripture and biblical inerrancy. So he takes the opportunity to refute another kind of error that had come up, and it was the idea that maybe the sacred authors, in writing the historical sections of Scripture, um, aren't actually meaning to assert it as true, but are simply conveying what people thought at the time, which in, the, in that case could contain error. Um, and Benedict the Fifteenth excludes that way of framing the issue, because when people put forth historical narratives, they're not, they don't mean to put them forth simply as maybe true, maybe false accounts of what actually happened, but the sacred authors are putting them forward. Um, as um, historically accurate. Yeah, so here, here's the words of Spiritus Perlaclitus, which states that there is, uh, it's condemning the idea that there mm -hmm. can be these historical errors because mm -hmm. these, you know, the, the record of King Ogag in this Megiddo, whatever, is not really that relevant to our salvation. So they could have just made an error there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something and along I, those yeah. lines. So Benny the Fifteenth condemns that idea, right? Okay. Right. So let's go to Pius the Twelfth. Is that okay? Am I going too fast? Go for it. Yeah, yeah. No, no. This is good. This is good. Okay. So Pius the Twelfth weighs in with um, a great biblical encyclical, Divino Afflante Spiritu. And um, in this, so 1943, middle of World War II. I don't know how he did it with his all his other pressing concerns. Um, and um, he does two things here directly with regard to our issue. And the first is to reaffirm the teaching of Providentissimus Deus, Leo the Thirteenth, and therefore also Benedict the Fifteenth. Right. So to reaffirm plenary inerrancy, right, that all of Scripture is inspired and therefore inerrant. But he thinks so. That's the first thing. Second thing is he um, introduces another. Um, aspect of the problem that I mentioned earlier, 
and that is um, we have to rightly understand the intention of the sacred author in what he was trying to convey through his words. And here, let me make a little parenthesis. Um, scripture has more than one meaning, but here we're going to directly speak about the first meaning of scripture, and that's the meaning of the words as intended by the sacred author. The other meanings are the meanings of the deeds described by the words, and that would be biblical typology. And um, Pius XII is not directly concerned with that here. Obviously, we want to hold that scripture has these other senses, but we're speaking directly about the inerrancy of scripture in its first primary or literal sense. Right? And the literal sense is the meaning of the words rightly understood. And here our terminology is unfortunate. Because when people, the layperson of the view, here's the word literal sense, the phrase literal sense, right? He tends to mean think that means taking it completely literally. And that's not what we mean. We mean maybe a better translation would be the literary sense. That is mm. the sense of the words rightly understanding the metaphors and literary devices that an author uses. And Pisa 12 points out, this sometimes we can make a mistake even with contemporary forms of literature, right? I can read, I don't know, James Joyce and not rightly understand what, uh, uh, what he's conveying by his words. If that's true with regard to contemporary authors, how much more we should expect it to be true with a work written in Hebrew, you know, a thousand BC. Um, and so the Old Testament is going to have lots of difficulties in rightly understanding the literal sense, not because of error, but simply because I'm not getting the metaphors. And so it's true according to the sense intended by the sacred author, what he intends to affirm. And then a second thing is Bible has all different kinds of literature, right? It has poetry as well as prose. It has historical, but also par parables. And each different literary genre has to be understood and its truth according to its own. Um, so the truth of a poem is different than the truth of an historical narrative. And right. even an historical narrative can use different styles. And so one of the things Pius XII points out is that the first 11 chapters of Genesis have a very unique literary genre because they're dealing with the beginnings, in other words, with events that happened long before historical records. Um, and so he says that's a unique literary genre. And he says, this is in another place in Umani Generis. In 1950, he comes back to this. And he specifies there that the first 11 chapters of Genesis, yes, are history and have to be understood as true, but a very unique archaic kind of history that makes you use of images that we might associate more with mythology. Not that it is a myth, but that it's using language in a unique kind of way. And so we have to understand that um, when we um, interpret it. And that's not going to be easy, right? So I, what I shouldn't think is I can just simply open my Bible and perfectly understand um, the meaning of Genesis chapter two. Right. And okay, and so... Go Sorry, um, just real quick. So just mm -hmm. again, to, to establish a new baseline, here we are in 1943. Mm -hmm. And with all of the proper qualifications being made, mm -hmm. Catholics are still not right. permitted right. to think that scripture has error. Right. So Pius XII okay. is not saying Genesis 1 through 11 is full of errors. He's saying okay. it's difficult to interpret. It's true, but it's true according to the sense that the sacred author intended to um, communicate through his words. Yeah. So this is, let's read this. Yeah. I, I just wanted to bring this out before we got into okay. Vatican II, because this is from Humani Generis. And this is, so this is condemning some false opinions, threatening to overcome the Catholic foundations, as it says. Uh, so this is Pius XII. He says, for some go, some go as so far to, as to pervert the sense of the Vatican Council One's definition that God is the author of Holy Scripture. And they put forward again the opinion already oh, often condemned. condemned. And I'm emphasizing that point because, as, as Dr. Final just said, this has been condemned on various occasions. Mm 
which asserts that immunity from error extends only to those parts of the Bible that treat of God or of moral religious. So that's limited inerrancy right there, limiting yeah. the inerrancy only to the religious matters. So the Bible is can be an error with scientific phenomena, whatever. But uh, one point I wanted to raise oh. just for the sake of um, mm -hmm. viewers was something that Providentissimus Deus yeah, brings excellent. out as well, which is uh, scientific observation where when the scriptures say something that appears to be the, like, for example, the firmament talks about the firmament, which was understood to be basically this cone that covered the sky out of which the, the, the water was held above the firmament. And there were little holes in the firmament that went down and created the rain. So that would be just the, but Leo 13th points out that that's just, that's just a phenomenologically true thing to say. You're, you're just looking at the sky and it looks like a cone and there goes the, the rain. <laughs> so it's true in the sense of that's what you see. It's not trying to describe here's all the exact scientific, you know, details of this thing. It's just describing what you see. Can you speak at all to that aspect of yeah. an alleged Excellent. error? Yeah. So another example would be scripture um, speaks of the sun rising. Right. And so that the sun moving in the sky comes up with regard to a miracle of Joshua. Yeah. So we shouldn't take that to mean to imply a particular theory about, you know, cosmology. Um, as if that were being asserted by the sacred author, right? And this unfortunately came out in the Galileo case. And that would be to misinterpret scripture's intention. Scripture speaks in a similar way as we do. And I would say that the sun rose this morning and um, not intend to contradict a particular scientific theory, but simply to speak according to the appearances of things. So Leo XIII puts down that principle as a basic way of resolving unfortunate apparent conflicts which aren't real conflicts at all such as came up in the galileo case so basically the the magisterium more or less establishes and we didn't even go into the the condemnations of london and Taboli, which also include mm -hmm. rather forceful condemnations of limited inerrancy as well right, right. um so right. Pius at, the 10th yes in, the in 1907 in the modernist crisis right so Again, at, at going into vatican II. What happens at Vatican II regarding this particular controversy of lit, limited inerrancy? Yeah, so I think the intention of, um, of De Verbum here is to receive, above all, Pius XII's teaching. And that means, because that includes the teaching of Leo XIII and Benedict XV. And that is to, um, to assert the truth of Scripture and all of Scripture, because all is inspired, all is inerrant, but at the same time, to put down the principle that Pius XII had highlighted, that we have to rightly um, identify the literary genre. In other words, we have to rightly understand the literary conventions that a sacred author is using and, and not jump to conclusions that he's made a mistake simply because he's speaking metaphorically. Um, and so it's doing both of those things at the same time. And so it lays down some key um, principles. Maybe we should... I don't know if you want to pull that up. Um, but I'd like to start where it speaks of um, in composing the sacred books, God shows Which men. page? Sorry, so which page? Oh, for my book, it's um, 331. Okay. So Vatican II is chapter 11 of De Verbum, uh, paragraph 11. In composing the sacred books, God chose men. And while employed by him, they made use of their own powers and abilities, right? So God, that's part of the teaching on inspiration, is that God chose um, human beings with their own gifts and talents. That means literary ability and um, the fact that they were eyewitnesses to certain events like the um, um, Matthew and John. Um, and he made use of their powers and abilities so that with him acting in them and through them, they, as true authors, consigned to writing everything and only those things which he wanted. All right, so that's them. So they're true authors, the sacred authors, but God is the principal author who's working through them by way of inspiration. And inspiration is um, working on their intellect, illuminating their mind to see the truth that he wants to communicate through them, to rightly judge the truth that they're writing about and to use apt words in putting it in writing. And, and that there 
is um, Leo the Thirteenth and Providentissimus Deus clarifies, right? That that how God inspiration, God acts on the sacred author in those three ways, all right? And then it, the next paragraph, the uh, De Verbum Eleven. Therefore, since everything asserted by the inspired authors or sacred writers must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit, it follows that the books of Scripture must be acknowledged as teaching solidly, faithfully, and without error that truth which God wanted put into the sacred writings for the sake of salvation. We need to unpack that sentence. Um, so I'd like to, um, so first, the first point is that paragraph needs to be connected to the one right before it on inspiration because it's a consequence. Right? And that's why it has a therefore, right? So the, the second part starts with therefore, since everything, and notice the, it doesn't say since some things or some parts of scripture, but everything asserted by the sacred author must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit. So that too is in perfect harmony with the teaching of Providentissimus Deus, right? Um, and um, Pius the Twelfth, um, Umani Generis, right? Because it's everything asserted. But notice that the word asserted was also carefully chosen because not everything I say is something that I'm actually asserting. So let's take an example of that. The sun rose this morning at, you know, 6.30. I don't, I'm not actually asserting some cosmological theory that has the earth at the center and the sun moving around it. That's not at all what I'm asserting. And so words have to be rightly understood to know what an author is actually asserting. What they're asserting is what they mean through those words. That's what's inerrant. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. That's really the key point here. And then, so that would be more like the analogy I gave earlier about the concert. Right. Right. Okay. What you intended to affirm is that it was a great concert, not that you know the whole universe was there. Yeah. Okay. Right. Or. Mm -hmm. So we we have. And that's, uh, and that's, sorry. Let me just say one more thing. No, no. No. Go ahead, please. Please. That's not so easy, right? I think that's really important to keep that in mind. To know, I shouldn't be too quick to think that scripture is making a mistake because I shouldn't be too quick to think I perfectly understand what the sacred author intends to assert. Right? And so we can take it back to that quote we read earlier by St. Augustine. Right? If he gets some problem, there's always that third possibility. I'm not rightly understanding what the sacred author intended to assert by his words. And the reason I was trying to find that the quote from Mm -hmm. Benedict the Fifteenth, but he he mentions the reason why why is this so important? Why are we talking about this technical issue with Scripture? Mm -hmm. Is because Benedict the Fifteenth says, "Hey, all of these people want to restrict the limitations of Scripture to only these saving truths." And then Benedict the Fifteenth says, "Well, it's because they they themselves then become the judge of what those right. which are the saving truths." Mm -hmm. right. Well, these moral precepts over here are not saving truths, so we can just disregard those. Those are just historic. That's what they said at the time. That was just that was then. This is now. You know. Then basically, when when you're not when a a, a the faithful are not subordinated in their will, intellect, and their hearts to the Holy Scripture, the revelation, the tradition, then they can just pick and choose. So right. by restricting that revelation, and this is what we see today is, is people claiming to be theologians, uh, restricting this, this, uh, this inspiration in order to push some agenda. Right. Right. Do you have any exactly. comments on, on that? Uh, why this is so important, Dr. Frankel? Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. It's, um, and this, the fathers of the church, St. Augustine and St. Jerome highlight this very strongly. In other words, St. Augustine, says, if we start to admit that there are errors in scripture here, there, and it's a matter of determining which, you know, um, are the religiously significant ones that are true and which are the religiously insignificant ones, everybody could see that it's no longer going to be a measure of God's revelation for me, but I now become the measure. Right. And it, it inverts the proper order of divine revelation, God teaching us, and he knows what he's talking about. And it's not about me judging what is the um, the true part of scripture and what is the false part? Yeah, but so, I still have to be. In other words, it's a matter of fundamental humility before the Word of God, and it's a double humility. It's wanting to be taught by a true Word, but also recognizing 
that maybe I, I might not be rightly interpreting that true word. And so it's a kind of double humility there. Yeah. So one of the things that you bring out in your text so well, faith comes by hearing, is that you bring out the, the relevant sources. So going back to that distinction that I, I said at the beginning, the relevant sources, which firmly and unambiguously confirm that the theological meaning of this text is not limited inerrancy because right. the issue is that if you if you said for the sake of your salvation right uh let me let's pull say, it up again. Okay. Uh, yeah yeah so the the issue is that as you say in your book this can be taken for the sake of salvation that phrase can be taken as a restrictive phrase restricting what is true or that's the wrong interpretation or you can take it as for the per the whole reason he put it in the scripture was for this purpose. It's it's sort of a purpose or finality or telos right. meaning. Right. Um, Technical term, final right. clause, final giving clause. the reason for the whole of God's revelation or salvation. So the issue that I found, Dr. Feingold, was that I found I, I became surprised um, that this this text was actually being misunderstood by otherwise well-meaning orthodox, well-learned, erudite theologians. And I can cite a number of texts to that effect, but the one I do want to cite here is this uh, catechism, which is the UCAT. So this is the, oh, the text wow. I'm okay. citing here, the uh -huh. UCAT. So this this um, this is a catechism published uh, originally in German, but it has a forward in oh, Pope Benedict XVI that has the imprimatur, nihil abstat. Um, and what's sort of confusing to me just look looking at this from a lay person's perspective here's um this is page uh what page is this um i'll give you the page in a minute but here's a screenshot from the actual text and it says this how can saves of scripture be truth if not everything in it is right so it seems to assume that limited inerrancy already here and then it says the bible is not meant to convey precise historical information or scientific findings to us moreover the authors were children of their time they shared cultural ideas around them and often were also dominated by its errors. Nevertheless, everything that man must know about God and the way of his salvation is found with infallible certainty. So this text, I don't, maybe the German was a little bit more precise. I don't know, maybe, but it, it, at least, it least certainly appears to me, this English on a plain reading from just a, a non theologian layman, if you just read that, it seems to say that limited inerrancy is true. Right. It's a misleading text, even though much of what it says is true. So it's true that it's not intended to convey scientific findings. But what's very misleading is to say that it's not meant to convey precise historical information. It's putting on the same plane what Benedict the Fifteenth wanted to, to say. We didn't get to speak about that, but um, Leo the Thirteenth used this principle for scientific findings. Right. That scripture doesn't intend to give us, you know contemporary physics um, or, you know, contemporary theories, but is speaking according to appearances. And Benedict the 15th says, you can't say the same thing about history as, as we're saying about science. And the reason is because much of what God reveals um, is deeds. It's in other words, scripture, God's revelation isn't just through words, but it's through deeds as well as words. And the deeds are actually more important than the words, the key deed being the incarnation and the life of Jesus Christ, his passion, death, resurrection, ascension, founding the church, choosing the apostles. All of those things are precise historical events that scripture gives us, right? And so it's very misleading to say that the Bible isn't meant to convey precise historical information. Um, and yes, <laughs> that right. would be to, I mean, it, it depends. Certain um, but yeah, just taking it at face value, yeah. that's not good at all. So when, when I researched this, for, when I wrote my book uh, about mm -hmm. it, just again, from a kind of lay person's mm -hmm. perspective, just like, I want to know what the truth of church is. What is the church teaching? When I, when I compared the original schema of the uh, De Fontimus Revelationis before this controversy, because there were at least I don't know how many bishops there there one the, the one text cites uh, Bishop Koenig of Vienna who actually preaches limited inerrancy on the council floor at Vatican II. So there are some bishops I don't know how many who were pushing for limited inerrancy. Right, they're a um, small minority I think yeah. on the council floor. But the uh, so the original schema is extremely strong condemning limited inerrancy. Very strong. It says 
there's no error whatsoever, either sacred or profane things, no error whatsoever. Whereas this text is seems to be not only abusable by bad actors who don't really care about doctrine, but also misleading for good Orthodox theologians who yeah. just haven't read all of the all the documents that you cite, for example, in your book. Yeah. So I this see. is why this is why yeah. I would assert this is why I would assert that theologically speaking, in the intrinsic nature of the text itself interpreted properly, there's no error. There's no problem with it. But in its historical event of promulgating Day of Arabum 11, it, it, I think it was historically the cause for some confusion, even among good theologians. What do you think about that? I, I still want to defend the our final text of Dave Verbum as beautiful and um, a magnificent text. But yes, sure, everything can be misinterpreted. But I just don't think there's any real foundation for misinterpreting this. But is that is that due to the the grammar, the sentence yeah, structure? Let's, let's of, pull it up again and let me. Uh, because I I, I, I would I would disagree with what Flanders is saying here that it's really open to uh i i don't think it's ambiguous right and i i'm not a latinist but it's my understanding after having read you know much of the same things that that tim has read mm -hmm. um that the grammar of dv11 doesn't allow for yeah. us to walk away thinking that limited inerrancy is proper i, I reviewed right, uh Augustine Bea and Father okay. Brian Harrison and, yeah. and your text and, and others. And it just, it doesn't make sense that this is still, or I should say, again, an open question. Right. Well, let, let's go through it and, and go through how we ought to interpret it using the rules. Then we can take up again the historic question. I'm not, I don't want to say, I mean, I don't totally disagree with you, uh, Tim, about the historical sense. Um, but let's let's look at how it should be rightly interpreted. So I think the first principle about reading any text whatsoever is to read it in its context. And that means to read it in the light of the beginning of the sentence. And here, the beginning of the sentence says everything. Everything asserted by the inspired authors must be held to be asserted by the Holy Spirit. So if I keep that in my mind, when I continue to read the rest of the sentence, it would be, um, I think, foolish to think that the end of the sentence would contradict the beginning, right? So that's just a matter of benevolence in reading any author's sentence to think that they're not contradicting themselves in the course of it or that the beginning and the end ought to go together. So when it says everything, I think I should think that truth which God wanted put into the writings for the sake of salvation is equally referring to the everything asserted by the sacred authors. That's my first point. Second principle is that in reading magisterial texts, we want to use a different principle than other texts. So what I just said about the context applies to every single text, but this is proper to magisterial texts. And that is that we should assume that different texts of the magisterium, say separated by 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, are not going to directly contradict the preceding text, magisterial texts. And if they do so, they'll let you know. Yes. Right. And so here, therefore, we have to presuppose. So this is something that Pope Benedict um, referred to in his fantastic address to the Cardinals in 2000, first year of his pontificate, um, his Christmas address, where he spoke of the hermeneutics of continuity. And it's especially for so Benedict knew, just as the rest of us, that many texts of Vatican II had been twisted from their original meaning, according to a spirit of the council. And he wanted to defend the council documents against um, misreading them according to the spirit of the council rather than the actual text of the council. And that's where he spoke of the, the hermeneutics of continuity. And that is to read any particular text in harmony with what came before and after, unless it's clear that a departure is being made. And so according to that criterion, I should read this in harmony with Benedict, with Leo um, the Thirteenth, Providentissimus Osteus, Benedict the Fifteenth, and Pius the Twelfth, and especially since the footnote of the text refers me back to those texts as authorities, not as something it's disagreeing with. Right. That's the, our second right principle. And the, these are all, ju all just the the theological principles of interpretation. Um, yeah. and, and as you say in your book, uh, actually, let me put this up first. Um, so 
let me just i want to just note mm -hmm. one more um mm -hmm. difficulty and that that this is the um this is a quote from father francis martin so this this is a this is from this is from this book vatican II: renewal within tradition edited by levering and lamb and what i what i found sh surprising to me was that there's two there's two essays on all the council documents in this book it's a very it's excellent volume mm -hmm. great great text but in this volume the two essays on Dei Verbum actually disagree with each other on this yeah. exact issue, okay. which is surprising. You know, this is an uh -huh. example of this is I, I listened to Father Francis Martin for years. I, I really loved his scripture mm -hmm. and exegetic exegesis. But he said he he reads Dei Verbum 11. He says that Dei Verbum 11 eliminates many of the problems of the inerrancy debate and allows a simple acknowledgement of the inaccuracies, historical, textual and so forth that appear in the sacred text. And then in his footnote. He mentions a, he asserts that there's a bunch of this a bunch of historical errors in the Bible, um, which would lead me to believe that he has misunderstood De Verbum eleven. But we know that he's one of the good guys. He's right. you know trying to be orthodox mm -hmm. here, you know. So right. my my so my contention would be like, well, I, it it does it does appear that and it's very intrinsic level, you know, if, if we all know Latin and we read the mm -hmm. Relatio and everything, because I, I want to bring okay. out one, one footnote from your text, which I think is pretty much the slam dunk. It, it closes any, any assertion that this teaches a limited inerrancy, um, which is your footnote here. Uh, let me put this on, which is quoting from, I'm not sure if this, is this the Relatio or is it just some sort of doctrinal commission? But this is the official what, what you have here. I don't know if you can read this, but this is from Brian yeah, Harrison. Brian Harrison's translation of the the official. So what this is. So for viewers, what this is, this is the official interpretation given to the council fathers at Vatican II before they voted on the document itself. So this is the official interpretation. And the problem with this is that these things are only in Latin. So mm -hmm. only if you'll know Latin in the first place that you can read these official interpretations. But let me just read this really quick. This okay. this closes. This is on your uh, right. footnote 66. It just says um, this expression that we're talking about does not imply any material limitation of the truth, truth of Scripture. Rather, indicates the spirit's scripture's formal specification. As I take that to mean that the final clause, as you say. Right, right. So let me give a little background for this. This would be a third principle of interpreting a magisterial text that's more difficult and not something that lay people can generally do. And that is, you need to interpret any conciliar text insofar as you can, according to the acts of the council that clarifies the meaning of the text to the council fathers that are voting on it. So let me any, any magisterial text, so all the texts of Vatican II are written, first of all, by a committee, and that they make a text, it gets um, criticized and, and um, changed and redrafted and, and so forth and so on, and then at a certain point gets submitted to the Council of Fathers for votes, they express they agree with this, they don't agree with that, they want this change, they want that change, and it goes back to the committee, and there's a whole process, and when it's finally submitted to a vote, the, um, the drafted committee will give um, the reasons why they chose to change something or not to change it. And for Vatican II, we have these, these acts of the council have been preserved, they're in Latin, it's true, but um, scholars can have access to them. And that can help us to see the meaning that the council fathers had in mind when they voted for it. So in this particular text, we um, have a lot of information because Paul VI was concerned about the preceding draft, which was a little bit different. It's instead of saying that truth that God wanted put into scripture for the sake of our salvation, it simply said saving truth. And Paul the Paul, Paul the Sixth was worried that that phrase saving truth might be taken to imply limited inerrancy, which and would it, fall under the condemnation yeah. of Benedict right. the Fifteenth. And he did not want the document to say that. And so right. to remove the ambiguity, he asked for um, a, that phrase to be changed to make it less li liable to being misinterpreted. And so he offered a couple different 
um, choices, and the drafting committee chose what we have in our final text. And so that's very helpful to know that, that this text was chosen precisely to avoid the appearance of limiting inerrancy only to theological parts, as opposed to, say, historical parts that might contain error. And a, a very good witness to this was Cardinal Bea. So Cardinal Bea worked very closely with, um, so he was the head of the Pontifical Biblical um, Commission and the, the former, the rector of the um, uh, Pontifical Biblical, um, the school in Rome and um, the Biblical Institute. And he um, was very much involved in the drafting of this document. And so he wrote about it after the council and he made it very clear that um, he, in other words, he gave this history called the Sixth Intervention and he made it clear that the intention, both of the committee and the council fathers in voting for it was not to teach limited inerrancy, but um, simply to give the reason for the whole of scripture, the sake of our salvation. And the reason why that's there is simply to avoid, again, the, what Leo XIII spoke about, a, mis, you know, a misapprehension that scripture is teaching scientific theories. Um, in other words, that right. guides the interpretation. Everything that's in scripture is for the sake of our salvation. But that means everything, including the history that it contains. Yeah, let me just read some of that Bea quote that you have in your book, because I think it's really good. And I think it's a great phrase on this. Um, he, he First, he mentions the burden of proof, as you say, if they're going to reverse some precedent, the burden of proof is to explicitly reverse that precedent. So you, you have to interpret it with the tradition, unless if there is some kind of reversal or change, uh, like Divinia mm -hmm. Flantus Spiritu changed the, the understanding of the Vulgate to a degree. And there was an explicit explanation of what that meant. Um, but Bayes says this, he says, we declare in general, there is no limit set to this inerrancy and that it applies to all that the inspired writer and therefore all the Holy Spirit by his means affirms. And then he says, these documents of the Vagisterium require us to recognize that scripture gives a true account of events naturally, not in the sense that it always offers a complete and scientifically studied account, but in the sense that the what is asserted by the scripture, even if it does not offer a complete picture, never contradicts the reality of the fact. I thought that phrase was very helpful. Never contradicts the reality. Because when you say the sun rises, that doesn't contradict the reality, even if you believe in heliocentrism. It doesn't contradict those realities. There's two different aspects to this reality, what you see and what's actually happening scientifically. Two truths that are both true. Right. So, so here we have then, if I may, again, like ratcheting up, you know, mm -hmm. the, the timeline, 1965, Dei Verbum, still no Catholic can hold that scripture contains errors, all the proper qualifications that rightly understood, and, and so on and so forth, literary genres. So if I'm understanding you correctly, I've been listening very intently. Dei Verbum is simply echoing prior magisterium, expressing it differently. Sure, we, we've got different words used in the text itself, but the content, the meaning is still the same. Limited inerrancy ruled out. Okay, is it, this, is, this is correct. Okay, so as of 1965, still can't think that as a Catholic. All right, so with, with, we've got about five or 10 minutes left. Okay. What can you help us, uh, what can you say to help us understand the last six decades, give or take, where it seems like this has become an open question again? Because as, as Timothy mentioned, we've got uh, conflicting accounts in what mm -hmm. we take to be a pretty orthodox source. Yeah. Um, we've got the UCAT with an imprimatur that seems maybe it's muddy, we're not sure. So what, what's a Catholic to do? Are, I, are we I, revisiting I, limited inerrancy or not? No. But let me, something that I find helpful is to look at De Verbum 19. I don't know if you want to, if maybe we don't have enough time to go there. But that applies it to the Gospels. Because I think this is where notions of um, mistaken ideas of inerrancy can do the most harm. So I think in, in actual practice, yes, after the council, lots of people, I think, um, misread De Verbum 11 as allowing limited inerrancy, didn't read De Verbum 19, and thought, therefore, that what the Gospels give us 
with regard to the history of, of, of what Christ said and did might, you know, might have historical error. And so there were, and I think the key point is that not the teaching of De Verbum. It's exactly the opposite. So De Verbum 19 applies what it's taught generally in, in chapter 11 to the specific question of the historicity of the gospels. And I think that's really where the rubber meets the road. That's where it has the most profound consequences, right? Do I have to hold that Jesus rose bodily from the dead the way that right, the gospels describe? And, and the answer is yes. But it clarifies in the similar way that we said, I have to rightly understand what the sacred authors meant to assert. And so I think that Dave Verbum 19 gives a good way of reading Dave Verbum 11, right? So the fact that, so it, I mean, people like St. Augustine um, recognized long ago that there are difficulties in reconciling the four gospels, I think. Right. But um, he had the conviction that we should equally have today that they can be reconciled. And um, it's not an error when the different, say, gospels give them in a different events in a different order to make um, a theological point. It's not an error when a, an account is condensed, leaving out elements that another account gives more. Um, in other words, one can do, it's not an error when the exact words aren't given, but the sense is given. But what we have to hold is that they give us the sincere truth about what he said and did. And I think that's what we want to apply to the whole of scripture as well. And we have a, we're going to, we need to wrap up pretty soon, but I have a really great question here from my friend Dom Del Masso over at the Logos Project. Uh, very good work over there at the Logos Project. He has a very good question. I think it's straight to the heart here. And he says, could we say that Dr. Feingold's hermeneutic of humble interpretation of continuity mm -hmm not only reconciles what some thought was contradictory, but adds a positive deepening of the truth of revelation. What are your yes, thoughts I, on that? So I'm not sure exactly what the asker is, the, the, um, is intending there. But yes, I definitely think that reading it in the um, continuity, the hermeneutics of continuity, we can see a deepening um, in De Verbum 11 and De Verbum 19. Um, taking the teaching that had already been given um, and in making, including more clearly the um, what Pius XII had said about literary genre, rightly asserting, rightly understanding the literary right, um, sense, um, understanding the contribution of the sacred author and his particular ways of thinking, um, and then applying that to problems, say, in, in the Gospels. So yeah, I would say there's an a deepening, not a contradiction. Excellent. Well, we're pretty much all out of time. Dr. Feingold, do you have any final comments on this, this whole topic? Um, well, no, I just want to thank you for bringing this. I think this is so important in practice for Catholics to read scripture with that humility that God is speaking to us, but a second humility that maybe I'm not always rightly understanding it. And, um, and therefore, I want to listen in on what the tradition in all its breadth has to say about these texts inspired by God and recognizing that it's a process that will go on until Jesus returns. Yeah. So I think that the, the humble reception of God's word and that we see in St. Augustine, St. Jerome, St. Thomas Aquinas, that's what we need to have and recognizing that we need the whole church to be involved in the interpretation of scripture. Excellent. Thank you. Father, do you have any final comments? Um, just wanted to reiterate our, our thanks, our gratitude to you, Dr. Feingold, for being so willing to come on with a couple of uh, knuckle-headed laymen like us. <laughs> and <laughs> no, uh, honestly, we appreciate your time. We don't want to keep you any longer. Dinner mm -hmm. with your wife is very important. Um, <laughs> yeah. If I could just you know make a plug for Dr. Feingold's work, you can see folks on the screen, faith comes from what is heard. This is one of the best treatments of fundamental theology. Um, but he's written books on the Eucharist and the sacraments in general, and he's got a remarkable treatise on uh, nature and grace, Stay Lubac and St. Thomas. You, just buy them all. Buy them all. <laughs> read them all. And uh, be, be a, a, a fine gold junkie, just like I am. Um, <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> in, in, that, in that spirit, um, let me say thanks to all of our listeners here at The Meaning of Catholic. Don't forget to join the Guild.
support the work of this apostolate. We are laymen after all. We have families. We need to provide for our families. So if, if you can afford it out of the goodness of your heart, support us with prayer and maybe support us with a little cash. You can do that at meaningofcatholic.com. Follow us on YouTube. All of the things. Uh, Timothy, any final, final word here? Well, let's, let's offer it all up to St. Joseph, our patron of this whole Dialogos. So we're going to pray the prayer to St. Joseph, patron of the Universal Church, to close us out. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. O most powerful patriarch, St. Joseph, patron of that Universal Church, which has always invoked thee in anxieties and tribulations. From the lofty seat of thy glory, lovingly regard the Catholic world. Let it move thy paternal heart to see that mystical spouse of Christ and his vicar, weakened by sorrow and persecuted by powerful enemies. We beseech thee by the most bitter suffering thou didst experience on earth to wipe away in mercy the tears of the revered pontiff, to defend and liberate him, and to intercede with the giver of peace and charity, that every hostile power being overcome and every error being destroyed, the whole church may serve the God of all blessing in perfect liberty. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ Amen. is risen. Amen.